Thank you, Carrie. Okay, we, we're going to hear from two, two undergraduate students today. They have been selected as Kennedy Center Research Fellows. And so what this means is that they submitted a research paper to us. Um, generally, we, we like those that are uh, at least broadly related to the theme of the semester. And so I think you'll see that in terms of uh, buildings, walls, and bridges, the two presentations we have this semester uh, will um, fit, that, fit that theme. Um, we'll first hear, what we'll do is we'll hear from our two speakers, and then we will open it up for questions after that. We will first hear from Eliza Bennett, who is a junior studying political science with a minor in international development. Uh, she's a global politics fellow working with Professor Beasley in the political science department, studying the relationships between African nations and China. And when she graduates, she hopes to pursue a PhD in public policy and continue to work on gender issues within international development policy. Um, we will, after Eliza, we'll hear from Olivia Whiteley. She's a senior studying American studies with emphases on the arts and national security. She served as the managing director for the BYU-MUN conference, the executive director for Girls Lobby, a local nonprofit, the editor-in-chief for BYU's American Studies journal, Americana. Uh, so you can see she's, she's a busy woman, right? Uh, after graduating, she hopes to move to Los Angeles and work in the film industry. She's from Spokane, Washington. So um, please join me, first of all, in welcoming Eliza. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so my research is on the informal education differences between men and women in rural Africa. Um, so my research took place at a farmer field school in rural Malawi um, called SAFI, the School of Agriculture for Family Independence. So SAFI's program brings in adult men and women who are married to their um, campus for one year to, to participate in an agricultural program that teaches them best practices in the field and hopes to encourage them to go out and get higher yields and the hope is that they also will go out and have better gender equality after some classes and learning that men and women to be equal in the classroom. Um, so I've now gone two summers to Malawi to first do a research project and then um, follow up with some solutions to the problems I found. So. The first summer I went and uh, fielded a survey to the men and women at SAFI um, to determine what their experiences were and if there were any differences based on gender of their experiences. Um, one of the big differences we found were that um, women did not have any experience in a formal classroom setting while men did. And so only 70% of the women reported having only a partial primary or primary education. So that equates to about elementary school here. Um, and then 75% of the men reported having at least a partial secondary or secondary education, so high school. Um, this difference really affected the way they were able to participate in the classroom setting once they got to SAFI. Men felt more confident in the classroom, they felt confident going, they understood how to navigate that setting and how to succeed, while women were a lot more lost and felt a lot more discouraged. Um, this led directly into the next major issue I found is that women were not attending um, SAFI classes the same amount that men were. So 100% of women at SAFI reported missing class at least once um, versus 84% of men reported missing class at least once. And women were three times more likely to report, three times more likely to report that they missed more than once. What we actually found is that in the year long model, women had sporadic attendance up until about December, and then their attendance basically dropped off to zero. They stayed at their homes um, on campus while the, their husbands attended the class. Um, and so women started to miss out on a lot of curriculum. Um, what this did was it created a bigger gender gap between the husband and wives than they entered with. So in rural Malawi, there already are, it's a very patriarchal society, so there already are some differences between the men and women. So they come in having some differences, but Safi's curriculum and the attendance issues and the way that they were being taught made it so the men left Safi feeling much more empowered with much more information about how to go out and be better farmers to create their businesses more effectively, while women left feeling more discouraged. They didn't really have the same level of um, experience now as their husbands did, and so their husbands, 
their husbands now felt that they could take more charge in their homes, in their businesses, because their wives weren't, didn't have the same information. And so Safi was creating an issue simply because it was accounting for men and women the same way in its policy. Um, it assumed they would have the same experiences, but because of socialization, the men and women weren't having the same experiences going into Safi, which created, made Safi a negative place for women. Um, so the next year, I went back to try and implement some changes, but I also fielded a case study with the most successful and the least successful members, um, graduates of SAFI, to try and show SAFI that there is um, importance to gender equality beyond just um, there is inherent value in it. And so I did a regression analysis based on the bags of maize they were producing. So for context, um, I based on research by myself and then two other students who are actually here today, we, I was able to compile a data set um, to try and measure the gender equality within a home of these um, graduates. And I created a gender equality scale based on that from one to three. And then I also, I combined that with a data set that Safi had of how many bags of maize that graduate family was producing. And I found that for every point that a family moved up on the gender equality scale, they were likely to produce about eight more bags of maize, um, which is significant to the 99%. Um, these families were coming in producing about 15 bags of corn, leaving producing about 40 to 60 bags of corn. And so eight bags is a lot. That is a huge part of their harvest. And so showing Safi and its staff that by helping empower the women and making sure they also have a, a successful time at Safi, their students on the family as a whole will be more successful. Um, so to try and fix the problems the women were facing at Safi, um, I proposed two main solutions. Um, one was an in-the-classroom solution developed by fellow students, staff, and professors here at BYU. And the second was an organization-wide gender policy, um, which was drafted by myself and then a, st a staff member at Safi. Um, so the gender sensitivity framework is the in-the-classroom solution. Um, so we propose switching Safi from a written model to an oral model since many of the women reported being illiterate while many of the men because of their previous um, education had, li had literacy skills that the women did not have. And so by switching to an oral model, we hope that the women will be able to see succeed at higher rates. Um, similarly, we propose switching to hands-on learning since being involved in your learning has been shown to help you retain the information more. So since women can't take notes to refer back to when they return to their homes, the hope is that by in including them in hands-on learning styles that they'll be able to remember. Um, the third part is an attendance policy. Currently, Safi does not have an attendance policy, and so what we proposed is not a simple day amount that anyone can miss, but simply that men and women um, husband and wife have to miss the same amount so that women currently miss cr women currently miss to bring their children to the hospital or to do laundry while men only miss when they're sick so the hope is that by force by requiring husbands and wives to miss the same amount husbands will take on some of the burden of taking their children to the hospital or doing some of the household chores that need done um, the fourth point is a point that um, I think Safi does incredibly well, but if this framework were to be applied in other places, we would hope that they would take on, is that women need to see empowered women leading. Um, Safi currently has amazing staff, and a lot of them are women, and we, a lot of the interviews I did found that women were encouraged by seeing these powerful women teach them because it showed them that women can achieve more than what they're doing currently. Um, the fifth point is required participation. It's similar to hands-on learning. Involving women in the classroom will help them retain what they're learning more. And the last is a built-in evaluation. Um, currently, Safi's evaluations rely mostly on BYU interns going each summer and go going through a similar evaluation process that I went through my first year. Um, but that creates some problems. First, there isn't always a guarantee that a BYU intern will go and do the project that they need to evaluate on. There's not always a guarantee that there will be a gender intern. And so um, I worked with one of the staff at Safi to start trying to implement a quarterly evaluation that includes an evaluation based on gender so that any differences that men and women are experiencing um, will be caught early enough that the organization can make a change. Um, the, second one, the second solution proposed was an organization-wide gender policy to try and account for um, differences that women staff members were having and women students were having um, outside the classroom while at Safi. 
So the purpose of the policy was to bring Safi to being an equal opportunity organization that they had already committed to be. Um, so a, a lot of people in policy believe that gender blind is often the best way to go because it, if you're not gender blind, you think that you're sexist because you're treating men and women differently. But because of socialization and because of the way women, especially in places like rural Africa, they're raised, there are really inherent differences between men and women, their capabilities, their life experiences. And so you have to treat men and women differently in order for them to have empowering and successful experiences. Um, and so the policy framework goes through a variety of issues that we found at Safi that we believe, um, based on literature reviews, um, are things that other organizations are also struggling with. Why I was in Malawi, I was able to meet with a variety of organizations such as Oxfam to understand what their gender policy was at the time and help incorporate that into Safi's. Um, there are a lot of things that I think Safi didn't realize was going on that really <coughs> discouraged women. One of the ones is like, a point is creation of secure environments. Um, when they bring their children, they, when they come to the school for a year, they bring their children with them. Um, but women are often the ones who are delegated the task of taking care of children. And so because the children didn't have any place to go during that year, if they were under the age of the primary school, women were missing class to take care of their children. And so all of these points within the policy framework worked to fix problems that Safi was currently treating, was currently not accounting for because they were treating men and women as equal. Um, by doing this two-faceted approach to the solution, we hope to solve top-down issues and bottom-up issues. Um, in development as a whole, there's a lot of arguments about whether you should do things like in-country, bottom-up, let them create their own solutions or top-down policy changes. And I believe that this project did a good way, did a good job of merging both of those to try and account for as many problems as we could. So, thank you. Um, okay, so in a minute, all right, great, slides are up. So on the right, or my, at least my right, uh, in the dark purple dress um, is one of my best friends competing in Idaho's Distinguished Young Women pageant. And we've had like probably two big disagreements within the span of our long friendship. And the first has been on Marilyn Monroe's role in like feminist iconography. Uh, and the second has been about pageants. Clearly she is pro pageant. Um, and I am kind of like, eh, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm more skeptical of pageants. So if you're wondering kind of what a presentation on pageants is doing uh, in a class on international politics, stay with me because I'm there with you. I'm probably more skeptical than you. Um, so yeah, so my essay, how do I click this? What goes uh, forward? Okay, great. Um, and sorry for the picture quality. It, it's not because I can't make a screenshot. It's because like this is early 2000s photography. Um, so that's just how it looks. Um, but my essay begins with a sentence uh, from this article talking about Diana Franca uh, winning the Miss Latina Utah pageant and the Miss Latina US pageant. Um, and the sentence begins, Miss Utah Latina Diana Franca bested 18 other delegates to win the right to represent the, Latino, the Latino population in this country at the 2009 international finals. Um, KSL's description of Diana Franca's victory at the Miss Latina US pageant describes representation as a right to be won only by performing successfully in the evening dress, athletic dress, and interview portions can a young Latina prove she is worthy to represent the Latinx population. Simul similarly, immigration law requires those seeking citizenship to perform well on a series of tests to prove they are worthy to be included in the body politic, an interview, a background check, a citizenship test. Even the phrase, a body of law, connotes a relationship between corporeality and legality. In the pageant and citizenship processes, American immigrant imaginations of both Americanness and Latinaness materially affect outcomes. Only if they can prove their authenticity will they be able to win the crown or earn the right to vote. However, these imaginations of the ideal Miss Latina Utah or the ideal American are founded on standards of authenticity that are often racialized and gendered. Who gets to decide when you are American enough? 
or Latina enough. Martinuska's study of US media have found that the popular images of Latina bodies revolve around racialization, sexualization, exoticization, and tropicalization. Vallejo notes that imagined Americanness is centered on one primary factor, whiteness. While the effects of racialized and sexualized representations of Latinas have been explored in depth, the experiences of those performing as representatives of Latinaness and Americanness have largely been excluded from academic conversations of representative politics. In this study, I researched the experiences of participants in and interrogated the space of the Miss Latina Utah pageant by conducting six semi-structured, open-ended interviews using a snowball sampling method uh, and then coding the transcripts for keywords related to aspects of identity as described above. In the Miss Latina, is the Miss Latina Utah pageant, as Jennifer Esposito writes, a third space, a place that allows for complex and sometimes transgressive representations instead of only reifying stereotypes, and allows identities to resist stable categories, instead recognizing them as contradictory, unstable, and historically shifting? Is the Miss Latina Utah pageant a borderlands between Americanness and Latinaness, where participants perform a post border citizenship? Um, so I want to take a moment and talk about this idea of third spaces. What is a third space? Um, and in the discipline of American studies, uh, there is a hot debate about what America actually is. We're like the most disorganized discipline because no one actually knows what we're studying. Um, it's kind of funny when you're reading all these scholarly papers. People are asking, is it North America? Is it South America? Should we scrap all that and just talk about indigenous boundaries? Indigenous boundaries at what point in history? Um, there's this whole thing about this place called Turtle Island that's kind of a big deal. Um, what about airspace? What about ocean space? Is it an idea? Is it a set of values? No one really knows. Um, but either way, we're very familiar in American studies with this idea that Boundaries and borders are things that are constructed, um, which doesn't, to, which isn't to say that there aren't material consequences to those boundaries, right? I think we're becoming more and more aware, um, as a broader white middle class American public, of what those consequences of boundaries actually are. Um, but it is to say that boundaries exist because someone sat down at a map, drew a line, and then said, "This part is mine. This part is yours." Um, and when we think about the constructed notions that come with our current border, it's things like high militarization, um, it's inflexible, it's key to these claims of sovereignty, and sometimes the inflexibility of those constructions makes it difficult for us to see what a border potentially could be. So a couple of months ago, a few professors at a university in California installed a hot pink seesaw um, in between the US-Mexico border, and children on both sides were going up and down and playing together. And when we think about how that reshapes our understanding uh, of the US border, it entirely flips those constructions on their head. At that point, a border is something that is childlike. It's something that's playful. It's a place where two cultures can come together, rather than a place of militarized division. Um, and, and this paper, I argue that identity is similar, right? We have these fixed, constructed ideas of Americanness as white, middle class, Anglo-Protestant, uh, and then we have these fixed ideas of Latinoness as kind of racialized, hypersexualized, drawing on these stereotypes of the cantina girl, the devious vamp, or the self-sacrificing matron. Um, and sometimes the fixed qualities uh, and the high consequences of those constructions prevent us from imagining what could identity be, what could that look like uh, in America. So sociologists have found that culture uh, is one tool people may use to reshape ethnic boundaries. Just as Dowling describes racial frames as a repertoire of identities to be drawn upon, Swidler has found that culture can be considered a toolkit of symbols, stories, rituals, and worldviews which people may use in various, varying configurations to solve different types of problems. Recent theoretical innovations by Lazardo expand the academic definition of culture to include the implicit or non-declarative aspects of culture. Consequently, performance studies scholar Dwight Conkergood, who's like my homie, if you want to get into performance studies, I would recommend starting with this guy. Literally, I read his article probably once a semester just to like, bring joy back into my life. Um, but he posits that performative acts are embodied, tacit, intoned, gestured, improvised, co-experienced, and covert. Um, or, I also love this metaphor that drawing on the work of Judith Butler, literary theorist Karen Christensen uses, uh, if Latinx ethnicity is a spectacle requiring an audience for interpretation, having no original referent, and an ongoing discursive practice that produces the appearance of substance and the illusion of origins, then it is a type of drag show that parodies the notions of a centralized identity categories. 
Deliberate performances of culture have the potential to reshape ethnic boundaries, creating more inclusive imaginations of Americanness and Latinaness. As Christian writes, identity is thus an ongoing narrative that can never be outside representation, um, which brings me to pageants. Uh, this is the Miss Latina Utah pageant homepage. Um, Bennett Weisler argued that pageants specifically create a space in which the contestants themselves collapsed the distinction between womanhood and the nation. Bodies exist as what performance studies scholar my homie, Dwight Conkergood, calls the terrain of struggle and the field of power relations. As the intrinsic relationship between physical boundaries and group membership has begun to dissolve, Roberto Gonzalez argues that spaces of belonging that supersede legal, legal citizenship have proliferated. International pageants are an obvious and intentional site of performed identity. Bennett Weisler describes that they are rich sites for mapping the complex interplay constitutive of sameness and difference, femininity and feminism, and ethnic identity and nationalism. Specifically, the Miss Latina Utah pageant is a space where participants are incentivized to embody, perform, and represent the ideal Utah and the ideal Latina simultaneously. These incentives create a site of negotiation between ethnic cultures and hegemonic culture, implying borrowing, taking, appropriating, and sharing of distinct historical cultures cultural and political discursive practices. The Latinas who perform Utahness and Latinaness in the Miss Latina Utah pageant deconstruct or construct uh, the drag show of Americanness and Latinaness, creating a post-border conceptualization of citizenship. So this is the application, in case any of you all are interested, I'm just kidding, um, of entering the Miss Latina Utah pageant. And if you'll notice, citizenship is not one requirement of representing Utah or the United States um, within this pageant. So you can see uh, residency is asked, your current address, and then heritage. So parents' birthplace, grandparents' birthplace, and your birthplace. So it has less to do with whether or not the state can hand you a social security number and more to do with what your lived experience experiences um, have been like. Um, it's a space that kind of a lot, uh, democratizes this right to represent the United States. Um, and this is the list of the participants that I interviewed. So I interviewed six previous participants of the pageant. Uh, you can see word is like trying to draw rude borders around people's uh, heritage. So down with word. Um, but these pageant participants described to me um, what their experiences were like, and then I coded them for different ways that Latinaness and Americanness were represented. Um, so first, you kind of have their experiences with the more hegemonic aspects of identity. So several pageant participants felt that they were regularly excluded from imaginations of Americanness and Latinaness due to race. No one notes, and all of these are pseudonyms, by the way, so you're not going to be able to Google them and figure out who they are. Um, that sometimes I get told I don't look like one, a Utah. I don't look white like the majority of the demographic. Similarly, Natalie remarked, when people think United States, they just think people with like tall, blonde, blue eyes, you know. Uh, Camilla emphasized Utah's lack of cultural awareness and positive Latina role models. In addition to feeling excluded from the category of American, several participants also felt excluded from the category Latina. Because of her light phenotype, Paula experienced exclusion from the Mexican community. She described that people tell me, you don't look Mexican because I'm 5'9 and I've got lighter skin. And people think that Latinos in general look dark skin, short. Differences in language ability also marked someone as a proper Latina in the minds of some pageant participants. Noah was concerned that the Spanish she had learned growing up would not meet the judge's expectations for formal Spanish. Racial stereotypes played a crucial role in feelings of exclusion. Assumption, assumptions about citizenship and birthplace, in addition to phenotype and physical appearance, played a role in excluding participants from feeling American. During the pageant, Paula tried to be an example of the variety of our culture and races and colors. However, once she reached the international level, so she's representing the United States as a Latina, uh, Paula's right to represent the United States was questioned because of her place of her birth. She described that the other pageant participants were confused about why a Mexican-born person was representing the United States. They believed her position as the representative of the US was, quote, made up. A true Miss, L Miss US Latina should be born in America. She admitted that it was kind of confusing for me because the pageant rules are not that well defined, as we discussed. So there's some positives, that ambiguity, but also some way that allows bias to seep into the judges and other participants. In this way, the pageant structure is somewhat post-border. Citizenship does not determine one's right to represent the United States. Representation rights, like ethnicity, are somewhat based on self-identification in the Miss Utah Latina pageant. 
Um, and here's some more of the good news about the way this pageant creates a third space. Although racialized and birth-bound notions of citizenship somewhat pervade the pageant world, participants in the Miss Utah Latina pageant were able to reframe Americanness, Utahness, and Latinaness to cross borders and include themselves. Several participants eschewed borders, deliberately emphasizing the and of being both Latina and American. Sophia dressed both as a tapper and in an ind indigenous costume from Brazil during the heritage portions of the pageant at the state and international level, labeling herself equally tied to American American and Brazilian traditions. Noah described that even the title of Miss Latina Utah gave her family and community a way to feel included. Quote, it's got Latina. Oh, we can say that. Oh, that's so awesome. We understand what that is. Further, being asked questions about representing two different cultures, being second or third generation, or speaking several languages during the interview portion of the pageant validated both Noah's Latinaness and her Americanness. She states, the fact that we had those questions asked really does show, it really does show us that it's important to be aware and it's important to have, at least for me, in my mind, having both cultures well-versed, both the, uh, the American and the Latin. At the international level of the pageant, Natalie wore red, white, and blue as her costume for the heritage portion. While competing, she wrote herself into the narrative of the United States. She remembers wanting, quote, everybody to see that the United States is filled with people from other countries because we have a lot of immigrants here and I am one of them. And I want them to see that I am, I have my roots, but I live in this country that has, it's my home now. And I am part of this and I am part of the growing country of the country and I contribute to this country. Pageant participants intentionally created representations that crossed borders and demonstrated legitimate claims to both Americanness and Latinaness. Aside from creating a post-border third space where dual citizenship can be performed, the pageant participants redefined the core components of Americanness. Belonging was described in terms of participation rather than legalization. So these pageant participants are answering this question that American studies scholars are still like, what, what are we doing? Um, while describing her Americanness, Sophia notes the opportunities like speaking English well, knowing your rights, uh, entering into scholarship programs or taking AP classes that she has had to advance economically, educationally, and socially. Noah believes that a Utahn is someone who adheres to the Utah Constitution or who really does care about where our state is going and contributes to the well-being of the state. Uh, Americanness, according to the pageant participants, the representers of Americanness themselves, um, was not codified by legal status, a citizenship test, anything like that, nor written on the body in their phenotype or their tall, tallness. Um, instead, Americanness was a set of actions to be embodied by Latinas and white Americans alike. Thank you. We ask you to ask it uh, here in the microphone so we can hear both the question and the response by either Eliza or Olivia. Uh, please tell us your name, what you're studying, and then ask your question. Please. Uh, my name is Ruth Hardy. I'm a sociology major. Just a question for Olivia. Um, just in this research about pageants, what is your opinion now? Because like it's shown that it provides this identity for people and a platform for them to kind of promote their self-reported identity. So like, what do you think about it now? Yeah, um, great question. I, there's a, a lot of my research that I didn't talk about today just for the sake of time has to do with uh, the gendered effects of pageants, which are like in my study characteristically true of what you assume a pageant would be, right? So it kind of hypersexualizes women. Um, it causes them to focus on their body. They're judged with numbers, and that has sort of psychological effects that are negative and damaging. So I think I'm interested in seeing the ways that third spaces or places where Latina identity um, and American identity can be celebrated, perhaps outside of the sexualization of pageants, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Hi, um, my name is Megan Barnes. I'm studying family studies and French. Um, so I have a question about Safi. Um, when you like presented these changes and things like that, was it hard like culturally for these people to accept them? I know you mentioned that it was helpful to prove like that the more bags when women were participating 
participating, but do you feel like it was like something that will take time for them to like get, you know, like change their culture or? Um, that's a really good question. I think for the staff, it wasn't hard to hear. The first year when I presented this research to them, the headmaster of Safi said, like, thank you so much. Like, this is like a two-sided coin and we've never seen the other side of it. And so like, they're really open to it. The the reason I said I needed to present that there were economic benefits to women being empowered is that like, you can think something is really good, but it was like, they didn't really have a motivation to change still. Like they saw there were problems, but like their students were still successful. They were still being better than like the average Malawi farmer. And so um, they are accepting it and I think they are moving forward, but they needed the economic push to like see that like this would make the organization better economically, not just socially, so. Interesting. Hey, my name's Kenton Davis, um, and I'm studying economics. Um, and my question is for Eliza. Um, what brought you to Malawi? Yeah, um, <laughs> BYU has a really good relationship with New Skin, and New Skin funds the school down in uh, Malawi, and it's fun Safi. Um, so it is actually Kennedy Center program that brought me there. I found it on the Kennedy Center website. Cool. Check out the website. Check out the website. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, please join me in thanking our two.